NetRap um, was only incidentally a 3D printing project. What I was really interested in was making a machine that could copy itself. And I happened to use 3D printing to do that, but if some other technology had been available that would have worked better, perhaps that's what would have been used instead. Anyway, uh, lots of journalists over the years have asked me where the origin of all this was, and uh, I've always just vaguely said to them that I've been interested in the idea of a self-replicating machine ever since I was a child. And I thought with this distinguished audience that I have in front of me, I'd actually put some more detail on that for the first time for the general public, that's you. Um, so, uh, here's me, age 10, a long time ago, uh, and this is my world uh, at that age. Uh, basically, I was building things with construction sets, taking old television sets and washing machines apart, leaving the bits all over my bedroom floor, building them into other machines. And of course there was no internet then, but there were plenty of magazines with lots of classified advertisements in that would sell bits and pieces of mechanical and electrical apparatus to a ten-year-old boy who had any money, which I didn't. Um, and I'm ashamed to say that I also spent some time blowing things up with homemade gunpowder, um, which is the reason for the bottom left picture. Anyway, one day in one of those magazines, this advertisement appeared, and it said, a machine that copies itself. Send a 10 and 6 post... 10 and 6. Back then, British currency was based on some complete nonsense, like feet and inches or something. Um, and, um, so, um, anyway, send a 10 and 6 post order and a full scap stamped addressed envelope uh, to appear, etc, etc. Et anyway, I was completely intrigued by this idea, not only of a machine that copies itself, but a machine that copies itself, but it only cost a dollar. So, which is about what that's worth. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't have 10 shillings and sixpence. So I never got to send off my envelope. And time went on, but I didn't forget this about me, because you can see I've remembered it now. Um, I have to say that the apparent copy from the publication at the top there is a little bit of a cheat. I couldn't find the absolute original. That's fake. Um, Anyway, time went on, I managed to pass a few uh, exams at school and uh, went to university as an engineering student and that gave me access to a large technical and scientific library for the first time in my life and so I used that to go and look up the machine that I would have been sent had I had ten shillings and sixpence and this is it. Um, the two people top right are the distinguished biologist Lionel Penrose um, uh, and his son, Roger Penrose, uh, they did this work. Uh, Roger Penrose is now Sir Roger Penrose, the world's most distinguished theoretical physicist after the death of Stephen Hawking. Um, and uh, when he and his father did this work, he was even younger than he is in that picture, a few years older, in fact, than I was in the previous picture of me. Um, incidentally, if you're interested in this work, just point your phones at the uh, thing on the bottom right and then they'll take you to a video. Um, they made a self-reproducing machine which was un unbelievably simple. It consists of those cutouts you can see on the left there. And what happens is that when you shape them and think Brownian motion in a, a liquid with molecules, when you shape those cutouts, nothing special happens unless you link them together in a pattern. Then when you shake them, that pattern reproduces itself. Now, when you think about that, that is extraordinarily profound. It means that you can get self-replication with something incredibly simple, which is the reason why it only costs 10 shillings and six months, of course. Um, self-replication of a pattern is all you need for Darwinian evolution to start, for life to get going, everything. Um, and it's an interesting demonstration of the fact that you can have self-replication in any physics which supports the idea of geometric extent and the idea of change of time. That's all you need. You've got self-replication and then suddenly you've got life. Anyway, that was the idea. A few years later I got my degree and I decided to stay on to do a PhD. And at the age of 22, 
Um, I'm still using the library. Every week I go over and read that week's copy of The New Scientist just to stay up to date on all the other things that are going on in the scientific and engineering world. On the, I think it's the 3rd of October 1974, um, I can't quite read the date on that, uh, this issue appeared and it had a weekly column by the guy that the picture is top right. His name's David Jones. He used to write under the pen name Gidalus like the Greek who fell to his uh, son of Icarus. Uh, sorry, Icarus was his son, I should say, the father of Icarus. Um, and he had a series of mad inventions. And in this particular issue of the New Scientist was the very first public appearance of the idea of a 3D printer. It had actually been thought of a little bit before. A guy called Wynne Kelly Swainson had invented it and put a patent in some little while before this article appeared but that patent hadn't been published, so only Swenson and the people in the patent office knew about it. Um, Jones's idea was the essence of 3D printing. He was using lasers to solidify a resin in the form of 3D shape. And of course, it was just an idea. There was no practical implementation that far back. But this is, as I say, the first public appearance of this idea. And I remember seeing it and thinking, this is one of his madcap ideas that might just actually work. Just to get some idea of how distinguished and extraordinary this man was. Hands up everybody who's got noise-cancelling headphones. He invented them. They first appeared in his column. He was the first person to realise that you could have a carbon molecule in the shape of the hexagons and pentagons of a football, in other words, the fullerenes. Something that later, later got the Nobel Prize for the people who actually made it work. But he was the first person to think that that might be possible. Coincidentally, that cover of the New Scientist is actually a picture of the Nobel Awards, not that particular one, but I said the Nobel Awards. Anyway, so there was that 3D printing idea, and I wasn't involved at that stage. I wasn't involved for a long time afterwards. Um, I got my PhD. I went to work at the university, the top left, the University of Bath in the west of England. Um, and I had a happy career teaching many, many students and doing lots of engineering research projects um, until when I was about 50, at the turn of the century, um, the British government gave my university a wheelbarrow load of cash. There it is, bottom left, I photographed it as it went through. Um, and um, my university, rather foolishly, gave, well, not the whole wheelbarrow, but possibly a plant pot full of cash to me to spend. And uh, I decided to buy a Stratasys Dimension 3D printer with it, or as they were called at the time, rapid prototypers. And though I understood the idea of the technology and I'd been following it, I suddenly realized how powerful it was once I had it in my hands and I could use it to make stuff, something that you all know because you all have these machines yourself now. I realized that this is essentially humanity's most powerful manufacturing technology. And let me give you my take on why this is true. Um, is this. In order to see why 3D printing is so powerful, you have to understand how the shapes of things can be complicated. Now, when we talk about complicated, particularly if we're concerned with computers, um, we're concerned usually with how much stuff there is. So for example, if you've got a list of names and addresses, a million names and addresses are more complicated than a thousand, obviously. Anyway, on this picture, that sort of complication is this axis here, which computing people call combinatorial complexity. And normally that's the only sort of complexity you can have with a problem. The more stuff you've got to deal with, the more complicated it becomes. But as soon as you start dealing with shape, two other sorts of complexity creep in as well. One is analytical, the equations of the shape can be complicated in themselves, and the other is dimensional. You can have a two-dimensional shape like a triangle, which is simple, or you can have a three-dimensional shape like a pyramid, which is a bit more complicated. And so we've got these three types of complexity when we keep dealing with shapes, and of course those are the shapes that we want to make. Why is 3D printing so powerful way of making things? Well, it turns out that dimensional complexity is the killer as far as doing computing is concerned. Imagine you want to cut that turbine out of a solid block and imagine the little yellow tip thing is the cutter doing the cutting. It turns out, even though you're only making a three-dimensional object, 
you actually have a five-dimensional problem. This seems a bit strange, but the reason is this. The cutter can move left and right, forwards and backwards and up and down, that's three. But it can also twist about all of those axes, that's another three, so that's six. But it turns out that twisting about the axis of the cutting tool itself doesn't matter, so that leaves us with five. In order to solve that cutting problem, we need to solve a five-dimensional problem. And that problem is so difficult that we can't even do it today for every shape. In other words, there are some things that a cutting machine would be able to cut out if only we knew how to tell them how to do it. So we're not limited by the physics of the machine, we're limited by what we can tell it to do. And well, that's a sad limitation when you think about it. We've got machines that can do things if only we knew how to tell them to do it. 3D printing reduces the dimensional complexity. When we're making a turbine in a 3D printer, we're always just dealing with two-dimensional slices. We take a three-dimensional problem down to two dimensions. Any fool can use paint shop. Um, and so um, we've suddenly got something that's really easy to deal with. And that's the reason why 3D printing is so powerful. And in fact, of course, 3D printers are physically capable of making everything that they can. In other words, there's, there's no corner of their abilities that we can't get to uh, by defining a shape and getting them to print it. Okay, so given that power, I had the idea in 2004, uh, why not make a 3D printer print most of the parts of itself? And I set up a project, which you're all aware of now, of course, um, there is a picture of the very first replication on the 29th of May, four years later. Uh, that's me on the left with the parent machine, and that's Vic Oliver, who's one of the volunteers on the rep rep project on the right with the child machine. That picture you many of you have seen before. And that's a, the first rep rep machine that we ever designed, designed by me and my research student, Ed Sills, who's in the picture on the bottom right. Um, and so we've got the replicating rapid prototyper. Remember the Stratasys dimension was called a rapid prototyper, not a 3D printer. That was what they were called then. I gave it all the way free. Why did I give it all the way free? Well, if you've got a machine that covers itself, you can try and patent it. What we're saying to the world is, I want to spend the rest of my life in court trying to stop people going with my idea, the one thing it was intended to do. And so, uh, I've got better things to do with my time. Here I am, doing it. And here, it's really important to mention people like Vic, and I can't possibly enumerate them all, from all over the world who volunteered on the project and contributed software, and documentation, mechanical designs, published all sorts of things. The work was done by tens initially, and then hundreds, and now thousands and thousands of people. Uh, I'm a very lazy person. I believe in getting other people to do all the work. Um, and most 3D printers now that are made are rep wraps. Um, Joe will be pleased, sitting there, I can see him, will be pleased by the next slide. Um, here's, here's Joe's print farm. Um, and uh, I, I understand, Joe, that you're currently in the Guinness Book of Records for most 3D printers printing other 3D printers, is that right? Six machines printing of 3D printers at the same time. And I think I'm right in saying that, in fact, Joe's company ships more 3D printers than any other company in the world. Um, they're not the most expensive 3D printers, which is a good thing, uh, but they are the most new. Okay, let's broaden all this out a bit. Here's human history, all of it. Homo sapiens evolved about 300,000 years ago. Well, the paleontologists keep pushing this date back. That's, that's what it is today. Tomorrow it will be 250,000 years ago. Um, and, and I'm afraid to, sorry, to blur the tone or reduce the tone or reduce the happiness of the proceedings. This is actually a map of some misery because the vertical axis is poverty, where poverty is defined as not knowing where the next few meals are coming from. And as you can see, it's moving along there from left to right, steadily up in the 90s percent. Of course, the gathering of statistics 300,000 years ago was not quite as good as it is today, but we can be reasonably confident that people were not doing all that well. 
uh, for a very long period of history. Uh, incidentally, on this chart, I've put the invention of the bow and arrow there. Um, my name, Boya, means a maker of bows. And uh, so you can see that I come from a very long line of armaments manufacturers. Um, so, as soon as I saw this data, incidentally, you'll see in a minute, it says data, University of Oxford, which is where I got this from. Now, all the information that I'm going to present has a little credit on the line if you want to see where the data came from. Um, as soon as I saw this, I thought, well, the thing that must have done, click, click, we've got something right at the end, but things go really well very late. And I thought, that's got to be agriculture. It's got to be the invention of agriculture that caused that drop in poverty. No. Agriculture goes back about 12,000 years. Invented in Mesopotamia initially. Um, and unfortunately, our poverty line just carries right on through. It probably dropped a little bit, but we can't be sure. Um, and so about here, we have the Han Dynasty in China, the Roman Empire. Um, Still, everybody is very poor, doesn't know where their food is coming from in a few days' time. Um, and so, what's the next possible? Well, maybe it was the creation of machines. Now, we've had machines since about the time we've had writing. Um, things like seagoing ships, water wheels, horses and carts, hammers, pliers, all the things you find in a, in a blacksmith's forge, all that sort of thing. We've had those for a long time. Um, and so let's look at the invention of machines. No, that didn't crack the problem. There's William Shakespeare about there. But now we're beginning to see some detail on that reduction of property on the right hand end. What was it that did it? It was machines making machines. That's what the Industrial Revolution was all about. The idea that we could have a machine that made a machine. And that was the thing that finally cracked the poverty, the poverty problem for humanity. It's still not great. 9% is 9% too high. But anybody who thinks that 9% is an awful lot better than 90 something percent is not being realistic. And what's more, that fall in that graph is the most optimistic thing you can see because it means we can carry on. Now, there are problems with the Industrial Revolution, and we'll come to one or two of them in a minute, but nonetheless, that is a graph of hope and triumph for humanity. Now, people born today, sorry, people alive today, about there and later, including me, when I was 10, that picture in my very first slide, at least with my arms folded, um, I didn't know it at the time, but we passed through a significant milestone. We went down through 50%. And in fact, the drop has been getting steeper as time goes on. So, having machines make machines was a really good idea. Okay, let's look at manufacturing from a different perspective. Let's look at companies making stuff. Here are the world's biggest companies. Now, in fact, the first and most biggest, the most biggest, I can't really say that, the, the, the biggest companies in the world don't make stuff. The very biggest company is the International Bank of China which has 3.3 times 10 to the 12 dollars in assets. And you have to go down the list to number seven before you find anybody who deals with any actual stuff, as opposed to just adding up numbers and taking them away, which is what the top six do. Uh, that's Exxon Mobil, which is 3.5 times 10 to the 11 in market capitalization. Market capitalization and assets are not quite the same thing. Don't worry about the difference there. And we have to go all the way down to number 11, which is Toyota before we come to the world's biggest manufacturing company. And Apple, which is sometimes called the world's biggest company, actually comes in at number 12. Apple does have the biggest market capitalization, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the biggest company. Now, all right, that's a lot of big companies, and some of those big companies make stuff, but the world's biggest industry isn't there. The world's biggest industry is farming. That thing 10,000 years ago, I said, and this provokes a really interesting and curious and, and strange question. If that's the world's big, that bloke there is great stuff for his family and possibly to sell people, he's doing a noble job. Um, why is he not right up there in the world's biggest companies? Why does the world's biggest industry not give rise 
to the world's biggest companies. They are big agricultural companies, of course, people like Monsanto and so on, but they don't get it anywhere near the Toyotas and the Well, in order to answer that question, let's look a little bit to one side. Here's a picture of global manufacturing output. Now, I said that the credit for all this data was in bottom right. Notice the data there says Adrian back of envelope. Um, so this pie chart should perhaps be treated with a little bit of a pinch of salt. Anyway, the pie chart is a bit uneven. We've got this blue area, which I call L, which is five times 10 to the 12 metric tons of manufactured output per year. And then we've got this tiny little orange bit here, which is called MBL, and I'll explain what these initials mean in a moment, which is about a thousand times smaller. So we've got this enormous amount of manufacturing going on in the blue area, and this tiny little bit of manufacturing going on in the orange area. What are they? Well, they're these. L is life, all of it. That big blue bit is your hair and fingernails growing, and the trees growing, and the bacteria reproducing, and all the rest. And the little orange bit down there, is things that are made, manufactured by life. Birds' nests, motor cars, termites' nests, all of those activities that animals do that make things, not just human beings. And when we look at that, we can see something that's pretty obvious, which is that made by life doesn't do nearly as well as life itself. Made by life is self-replicating machines, living things are, you, me, everybody, trees, Wales, self-replicating machines, making stuff from stuff, making things from stuff they find lying about. Birds build nests, human beings build cars. We just find iron ore lying about, birds find twigs lying about. It's exactly the same process that's been gone through in these two instances. One's a bit more complicated than the other, but, so. but life does an awful lot better on its own when it doesn't have to make something with inanimate matter. Self-replication allows vast wealth production compared to made by life production. In other words, cells dividing, which is that's a diagram right here. And this gives us a clue as to why farming might not appear on that list of big companies. It's because self-replication is so easy to use that it keeps all of that activity distributed among a very large number of people. Farms tend to be small. I mean, there's a geographical constraint as well, of course. But no, no group of farms have ever got together and combined and combined and combined to make themselves as big as Toyota. It's never happened. And the reason is precisely because, and we'll see another example of this in a minute, because self-replication allows it very easily to be distributed among a very large number of human beings. At least I contend that's the case. I don't know of any research that's ever said this. Indeed, I don't even know. I haven't been able to find any research that's even looked at this question. So here am I just posing questions to you and giving my hypothesis for an answer. Okay, so how can we transfer the power of self-replication from farming, which is our only industry that uses self-replication, and has done for 10,000 years, uh, into engineering? Well, we've made a start with a rep rat project. Uh, it's a self-replicating 3D printer. Um, incidentally, I'm showing various printers with a little credit spot on right as I go through this talk. I, I apologise if I've missed yours out, or if I've missed out your favourites. I can't get them all. Anyway, uh, wheat is a self-reproducing machine, cows are self-reproducing machines, just like you and I are self-reproducing machines. But they don't just reproduce themselves, as far as human beings are concerned. Wheat and cows also make something useful. They make milk, they make bread. Um, so they're self-replicating, but they're also doing something useful. And of course, the rep rat machine was designed to be exactly the same. It self-reproduces, but that would be interesting in and of itself, but not useful. It's useful because in addition to self-replication, it can make other stuff, just as we can self-reproduce and make bread. So anyone with a plant can grow a seed for a frame, and anyone with a rep rat can make another rep rat for a frame. Anybody can have one. Okay, I said I'd mention some of the downsides of the industrial revolution. Here is obviously the most important one that we're all aware of, uh, which is the amount of carbon that the industrial revolution has put into the atmosphere. Now, if you power your rep rack from a filthy old coal power station like that one, short maybe their time on Earth, 
Um, if you power your rec rack from a filthy old coal power station, you're putting about 8 grams of carbon per hour at the smokestack of that power station. On the other hand, you're laying down as a solid permanent object 25 grams of carbon. So all the time you're operating your rep rack machine, you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere. And what that means is that if you use a plastic that's made from plants to get that carbon out of the atmosphere, then you're actually improving the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by reducing it the more you run your machine. Um, Polylactic acid is 3D printing material of a lot of people's choice. It's made from plant starch and RecRap was the project that first put it into 3D printing. Bottom right there is a shot glass made by Vic Oliver, the guy you saw in the previous picture, on the 13th of May 2007. That is the very first PLA printed object. And the carbon that was put down in that very first PLA 3D printed object is still in the form of a solid. It is not carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, now, as long as we don't burn the things we make, and as long as we don't put them in landfill where they decompose into methane, then, as I say, all the time when we're operating these machines, we're taking carbon out of the air. Okay, anybody who's ever done an economics course has heard of the idea of economies of scale. Uh, the idea goes right back to Adam Smith uh, in the uh, 18th century. Um, and I'm sure you all know how this works. Uh, a blacksmith's workshop making horseshoes, can make horseshoes, but on the right is a 19th century iron foundry, which addresses essentially the same problem, but he does it much more efficiently. And the reason it's more efficient is because people can specialise, you can have one group of people who are responsible for keeping the furnaces running, another group of people are responsible for advertising the product, products and so on and so forth. And the whole thing will make horseshoes or whatever else you want a lot more cheaply because it's bigger. And this is a standard piece of economics, and we can see instances of it all over the world in everything that's made. But there's a second phase to this, which is not so often discussed. It's this one. It goes into reverse. Cheap and simple technology reverses economies of scale. Top left, again 19th century, that's a laundry. Our great-grandparents used to parcel up their clothes and send them off to the town laundry, and three days later they'd come back all washed, must be even iron. Um, but nobody does that anymore because we've got robots in our kitchens to do the job. Um, the interesting thing about that robot is that it washes our clothes, of course, but also you're perfectly happy to have that robot sitting in your kitchen doing nothing for 95% of the time. You're happy to shell out that money and just have it sitting there for the convenience of that 5% of the time when you're actually washing your clothes. And of course this is extended into other areas of life as well, and has done so in the past. Even that filthy old power station is gradually being replaced by PV cells on people's roofs. Indeed, solar and wind are currently the cheapest form of uh, electrical energy. They're just not, they're just intermittent, which is a problem. Um, so distribution gives convenience and robustness. It isn't always the case that economies of scale work. Economies of scale work when something isn't sufficiently automated. Once it becomes so simple that you just chuck the toys in and press the button, or whatever, then economies of scale go into reverse. So distribution gives convenience and robustness. Here are some other examples. Today, everyone has their own CD pressing plant, uh, their own photographic lab and their own printing press, you all have these things. Of course, they don't look like those traditional versions of them, but you all run them. Um, and in the future, why shouldn't everyone have their own factory that makes more factories? Well, okay. That's a sort of cant around the project and some of the things that may happen in the future, some of the things that have happened already. I'd just like to finish by giving you a new 3D printer. Um, here it is. My new open source 3D printer. Now, let me say right at the start that there's a problem with this 3D printer, and the problem is it doesn't actually exist. So bear that in mind, and we'll take this forward. Um, I'm going to start with what it's based on. One of the things it's based on is the 3D printer from the Berkeley Livermore project. This is a really clever machine. Uh, this is a diagram I think from their paper, which I think was published in Science. Um, what it is, 
is it's like a, a resin printer which works by projected light, but it does it in an extremely not and clever way. Um, trying to work the laser here. Yeah? Oh, um, you've got a, a projector which projects a pattern of light into a cylindrical vat of resin. Um, so far, so conventional, as far as light and projection and resin solidifying is concerned in a 3D printer. But what they do is they do the equivalent of reversing a CT scan. The pattern of light is like the x-rays you get from a single projection through a CT scanner. They rotate the cylinder and change the light pattern, just like a CT scanner scanning around your body. And they build up a three-dimensional object and a single revolution of that cylindrical vessel, all in one shot. It's a really clever machine, very nice. It works, this is a real machine, unlike the one I'm about to propose. Um, and it has lots of clever and nice features. It's very fast, it's very versatile. Um, one of my favorite things about it is the way they deal with the problem of refraction of the light. You've got a cylinder here, which of course will act as a cylindrical lens, except it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is that they put the whole thing in a square box filled with liquid with the same refractive index as the resin, so that they're just projecting to a, throw a flat surface on a cylinder that's on It's so simple and very clever. That's one of the bases of what I'm about to show you. The other basis is this. Um, on the left is my personal version that arrived literally three or four days ago of the Spectra scanning system. Now this is like a CT scanner again, but it works with electricity, not x-rays. What we've got is a little bit of uh, electronics on the side here. You fill this vessel up with water, you put something in it that you want to scan, I don't know, some rabbit's lungs or whatever it might be, um, and you pass electric currents from these contacts through the water, and the FPGA in here unscrambles that data and turns it into a, a bit of a rather crude map of a pair of lungs, or whatever it might be that you've put in the, in the vessel. Now, maybe you can see how we can combine these two ideas. Here's my proposal for my new 3D printer. Um, we make a cylinder, and we cover the surface, the inner surface of the cylinder with electrical contacts, and we have a polymer in here that sets not with light, but with electric current. And then we have a computer drive a voltage onto patterns of these electrical contacts around the outside, in effectively the reverse of the way that scanner we just saw working was reversed. Just like the Berkeley Livermore system that reverses the idea of a CT scan. So what have we got here, if it works? Well, we've got a 3D printer. First of all, it has no moving parts. It's just a vessel with a liquid in it, and out will come a solid object, we hope. Uh, it should be able to print in seconds. You can run around those contacts as fast as you like with a computer, gigahertz if you need to. Um, it is highly speculative. I only invented it a couple of months ago. It contains many assumptions, the idea, and so far it's only been simulated. I haven't actually built one of these. So let's just have a little look at the simulation. Imagine we took this and we take a slice through that cylinder and we just put a single voltage across a pair of the contacts opposite each other. Uh, this is the electric field, ignore the flat bit, that's just the region outside the sun. Uh, this is the, the electric field that you get across the cylinder. Uh, of course you get a high point where one of the contacts is, a low point where the other contact is, and potentials in between that are in between. Now, let's assume that we can make a polymer that sets with electricity. What's the most likely way that's going to happen? Well, the amount of current that goes through it, obviously the more current that goes through it, the more likely it is either to set or possibly become liquid, maybe it'll go the other way, we'll see that in a minute. Um, and also the longer the time that we subject it to an electric current, the more likely it could be to change. So what we're talking about here is current and time, in other words, electric charge. That's the graph of electric charge from the situation that's here. Now what happens, when we run those electric charges around the disk slice that we've imagined we're taking across this non-existent 3D printer. Well, that's running once, ignore the raggedness, that's just the interaction of the uh, 
of the simulation with the grid that I'm using to simulate it. Um, we run around the circle and that's accumulated charges. And sure, we've got quite a bit of charge in the middle here, but we've got more charge around the outside edge. And this is rather inconvenient if you've got a plastic that's set solid the more electricity we put through it, because what that means is that we're going to get a load of sticky stuff around the outside of our cylinder and we'll get liquid in the middle, which is more or less the reverse of what we probably want. Well, if we're getting the reverse of what we want, let's turn the whole thing upside down. And remember, humble Loctite. Hands up everybody who knows Loctite has used it. Quite a few of you. Loctite is actually a marvellous material. If you put oxygen anywhere near it, it turns into a liquid. If you take the oxygen away, it polymerizes and becomes a solid. And that's of course how it works. You tighten up the nut on the bolt, and that excludes the oxygen, and the polymer sets solid and locks the nut to the bolt. Um, but let's suppose that instead of oxygen, we could make a similar polymer that worked with electricity instead. We might even have that electricity release an oxidizing agent. You can imagine an electrochemical, chem an electrochemical reaction that we have a characteristic of that polymer that's a bit like this. We don't put any electricity through it over here, and it's a solid. And the more electricity we put through it, the more it turns into a liquid like this. What happens if we now feed that pack of charges into that function? Well, the answer is that we get a solid where we haven't put much electricity through, and a liquid where we have put a lot of electricity through. In other words, this is solid at the top here, liquid at the bottom. We've printed a disk, which is a star. Okay, well, we printed a disk. Now let's whip the simulation up into three dimensions. Forget about cutting disks across it. That's a full term. And what I course, as you'd expect, is you increase the box that we put through. Now we can use that graph actually to print something just a slight bit more interesting, not very much more interesting. And this is a result that I literally generated and I'm about to step on the plane here. Um, we can use that radius against voltage graph causes to print something with actual features. In this case, a rectangular block. That flat face there has been printed by changing the voltage as we went round and round the cylinder in order to create a flat face according to that curve on the graph on the previous slide. Anyway, uh, if you're interested in that, point the phone at that QR code and it'll take you to the log of the whole project. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say, so thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you. Right. Um, has anyone got any questions? And if you have, wait until the kind gentleman who's going to give you a microphone gives you a microphone. Questions, anyone? Short answer, no. Um, however, uh, at some point, I am literally going to make do an experiment with Loctite. Um, and the reason I'm going to do that is because I've got some in the drawer. Um, <laughs> and um, it's almost certain that the first materials we're going to use, if this can be made to work at all, and it might not, if this can be made to work at all, the first materials we're going to be used are not pure polymers, they'll be gels. In other words, water plus a hydrophilic polymer, um, and the hydrophilic polymer will be made to polymerize by a, an electrochemical reaction in the, in the water with some sort of electrolytes in it, because we know we can make water conduct electricity much more easily than we can make polymers conduct electricity. We can get polymers conduct polymers, of course. But, um, so I was going to basically make an emulsion of Loctite in an electrolyte such that when I pass electricity through it, the electrolyte gives it oxygen and see what happens. <laughs> so that was what I, and it's almost it will work. But please copy this machine. If you ladies and gentlemen want to go away and do some polymer chemistry and let me know what happens, I'll be delighted. Any other questions? Um, would, would there be waste resin uh, from voltage getting too weary in Britain, like there is with um, powder for SLR? Uh, SLS? At the beginning, almost certainly. Um, because whenever you develop this sort of technology, it starts off inefficient and people make it more and more efficient by being clever and clever with it once it's been proved it can work. 
if it can be proved that this will work at all. Um, so yes, you're right. It would be it probably would be quite wasteful to start off with. But then the first steam engines were wonderfully efficient. Uh, you know, you've got to start somewhere. So I'm a mechanical engineer, but the charge, is there current flowing? Is it a capacitor? It's current flowing. The idea is that it'd be electric current. So you remember that I said that there was a, a graph back there of electric charge. That was basically current times time to all of the nodes in the grid. Um, so, so yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making the assumption, and it may be a completely unwarranted assumption, that we can have a polymer that changes state the more charge goes through it. We must have some questions from over here. Oh, there's a... Oh, it's all the okay. so, Sorry, Kate. Okay. Um, you put some previous slides dealing with carbon. Um, yeah. What about a suspension in carbon that self assembles into something conductive with electric current play? Yeah, that might be possible. Um, one of the things that's, that's been done in the past by people at Harvard is to take um, a polymer that's both hydrophobic and hydrophilic and use effectively surface tension on that polymer and water to cause it to stick together in patterns. Now, that transition from hydrophobic to hydrophilic is actually achieved with an electric current. It's rather, rather high voltage required, but nonetheless it can be achieved. So you can imagine that you could have a suspension, not necessarily of carbon, but of some polymer that changed from hydrophilic to hydrophobic depending on the amount of charge that had gone past it or gone through it and therefore might stick together or not stick together. So, yes, that's a possibility. I have no idea if it will work. Um, as with all these things, the only way anybody's ever going to find out is to do the experiment. Hi, I'm Hi. Andrea Manco, co-founder and CEO of Lab 141. Hello. So we, uh, we invented, oh, I shouldn't say invented, we manufacture clothing for brands using the principles of 3D printing, yeah. where we take one object, redimension it, and cut it on our small CNC. Mm -hmm. So we get asked constantly, do you see the future where people have their own 3D printers at home where they're printing their own clothing using filament that's made out of cotton or some other type of fabric? Yeah. I keep saying no because we're still developing our company, so I don't want to talk about a future beyond us. You, you, you don't like the idea of all your customers taking over your work. Exactly. Um, is there any way that you could see something like that? And if not, great, because I can tell everyone no. <laughs> well, there are already knitting machines, <laughs> um, which people can buy for their own home use, of course. Now, they're not making complete items of clothing, but they are making rectangular sheets with patterns and so on. Um, one can see all sorts of ways, and it's not so much through the printing, but one can see all sorts of ways that that technology could be more and more sophisticated. Indeed, you could imagine something uh, that would be a machine, I don't know, about as big as that speed is down or smaller, that could print, you know, make the whole one beat, make the whole one a beat. Um, now, the question then arises, how do the economics work out? In other words, how much does a family spend on clothing in a year? How much would the machine cost? And does it become worthwhile? Um, as far as red wrap is concerned, there's a paper in Mechatronics a few years ago that shows that the economics of red wrap makes sense for the average first world household already in terms of printing things like every, everyday trivial things like combs and cat flaps and coat hooks and, and all that sort of thing. Um, you can save money. And in fact, a significant amount of money is saved by not having a lot of transport, let alone the value of the actual goods. So, it really, I think, to answer your question, it comes down to more of an economic than a technological argument. I could see how the technology could be made to work. Could it be made cheap enough that it would become economic for people to work? 